Catherine came in that morning with uh, tears in her eyes and she hadn't slept all night. And she said, I, we're wrong. You know, for the very reason we thought we couldn't do this because we have children is the reason we need to do this because we understand what innocence is and what a child deserves. And if it's true that there's this many children stuck in this, how can we be selfish and not try? So that was it. And then I said yes, and off we went. And you know what? It was about a thousand times worse than I, my mind could have imagined. People would be beyond shocked if they knew what was happening to children. Like the very first case I worked, I was looking at this this, this imagery, these videos of children. Um, just, and I'm, I'm afraid even to get, I'm afraid people are turning off the podcast right now, mm, <laughs> right? Because it's so hard. It's so hard. Don't, don't turn it off. Yeah. Just hang in there for a little bit because if we don't listen to this, these children have no hope. That's it. And so we have to all shed a bit of innocence, right? To, to, to engage this fight. Um, but what people are able to do to children, it's just insane. And so we, um, it, it broke me. I mean, I, I the first case I worked, I, I remember running to my kid's school, picking him up, checking him out under some false pretense of the dentist or something. I took him home and just sobbed and held them. I'm like, I can't believe what's going on out there. That was Tim Ballard, a former special agent and undercover operator for the Department of Homeland Security and also former CIA. He's an abolitionist, NGO specialist, activist, and philanthropist, and is the founder and president of Our Rescue that rescues children from child sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. The selling of people human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world with 27 million enslaved, 6 million of them children. So many of us aren't aware of how widespread this issue is because it's not in the forefront of the media and it can feel foreign to us because we think it doesn't happen where we live. But if people knew what was happening, not just abroad, but also all around us, we would realize that this is the closet crime that is exploding and rising at astronomical rates. This episode is heavy, sobering and challenging but also important to hear. Be aware when starting this episode that we discuss some very heavy topics, including children and sex trafficking, but that there's a reason and goal in mind, how to protect our children and support those who are rescuing children from slavery. We cover what human trafficking looks like today in different parts of the world, including the US, why this issue isn't on the forefront of the media, how our rescue works with governments to rescue children both in the US and outside of it, online explicit material and how they help facilitate tracking down predators and finding the abused children, his recent trip to Ukraine and how human trafficking plays a role, the normalization of pedophilia and sex with minors, and the dangers of children using smartphones, gaming, and social media. I'll link below our rescues website so you can support their mission to end child sex slavery and be sure to check out the documentary he talks about in this podcast that will be coming out this year called Good Friday on what our rescue is doing in Ukraine to help rescue orphans and children at risk of being trafficked. I know this topic is so hard to even hear, but let's be brave together to learn what's really happening for the sake of these children who need us to care. We can't help what we don't know. Without further ado, let's begin. All right, we are on. Thank you so much, Tim, for coming here. I am so excited for this conversation. Very, It's a very sobering conversation, but really important one. So thank you for being here. Thank you. And I definitely want to get into um, like your story and how you got to doing what you do. But first, can you kind of explain human trafficking, what it is today? And I think a lot of people think, oh, it doesn't happen where we live. And it feels a little bit foreign. And it feels a little bit like something vague right? right but yeah just explain that yeah so human trafficking it's probably better defined as just modern day slavery um you know it's not necessary that someone's m moving a body right and that's what people think um because terms have a way of just kind of being kind of organically created right and people what does the trafficking mean it's the buying and selling of people that's what it is um and it's believe it or not the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world Wow. It's by, by most estimates, Department of Labor, UN, U.S. State Department. It's a hundred and fifty billion dollar a year business. Wow! So I mean, that's to kind of give some context to how much money that is. Um, it's roughly uh, the amount you, that would be required to purchase every Starbucks franchise in the world, every NBA team, and still send every American kid to college. 
So it's a lot of money, and it's it's shocking to people because they they think, but it's, but we got rid of slavery. That's I read in the history books, Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War, and and it's it's it is sobering, like you say, to consider the fact that there's more people enslaved today than ever before in the history of mankind. Wow. Um, you could add up all the slaves during that horrific period, and there's nothing worse than that period of the transatlantic slave trade. I'm not making comparisons other than to say that you can add all of them up, all those people who were enslaved over like 300 years, and there's still more people alive in slavery today than all of those combined. And the vast majority of slave labor, um, and then sex slavery, and then organ harvesting. And it's, it's, it's a major, major problem. And most of the governments of the world are currently kind of ill-equipped to deal with the magnitude of the problem. So what we're trying to do is empower them. Give them the tools, the knowledge, the training, whatever it is they need so that they can better do their job in locating and liberating people, mostly women and children. We focus on children mostly, but, um, but we have rescued many women as well as the children. Why is it growing so much? There's just this demand. You know, it's, it's, um, slavery has been around for pretty much forever. Why? Because as evil as it is, it's profitable. Right. I mean, you own somebody. That's a lot. You, you can get a lot of product out, whatever you're, what it is, whatever it is you're doing. So there's the demand, and that's just greed. Um, and then on the sex side, which is kind of our focus, we we have done some slave labor cases, but mostly it's sex, the sex trafficking of children. There's this demand. There's a sick um, sex addiction that's going around this this world. Um, the, it's a, it's a pornified world we live in, right? It's it's desensitized people. It's created brain damage in, in, in so many people that they want to engage in sex activity with, with, with children. And, and so that's why we see this increased demand for that. Right. And I heard you say once, too, that like comparing it to like the cocaine, other criminal enterprises that like you sell it once, but with a human, you said that you sell over and over again. Right. It's very profitable for these for people who are providing this black, dark, horrific market. Um, you can sell a child that we've seen 10, 20 times within a 24 hour period for 10, 15 minutes to, to engage in some horrific sex act. And yeah, with, with drugs, it's, it's one time and then, you know, but you, you keep this child and you can use them over and over and over and over again. So, so long as the world continues to create this demand and, and the United States, unfortunately, we're the number one consumer of child exploitation material generally year after year. So, so much of the demand is, is, in, is in the United States. Wow. So why, is, why do you think this isn't like on the forefront of the media? Like why is this one of the things that like not that long ago no one was talking about? And even now it's like kind of these things that's like, oh yeah, you hear about it, but you barely, it's barely talked about. You would think this would be like on the very forefront of the news and the media. Yeah, it's so disappointing. Um, you know, we, we get back from these operations. I just got back from Ukraine, as I told you a few days ago. And you come back and you're just like looking at what the headlines are and it kills you. It's like, this is the thing that's most important mm -hmm. when there's so many children being abused in ways that are incomprehensible, not just a few, millions of children, mm -hmm. right? Um, it should be the headlines every single day. And I, I, I go back to history and think, well, for hundreds of years in this country, it existed in this horrific form, this slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, which was slave labor and sex slavery um, also. And it wasn't talked about then either. Why? Probably for the same reasons. It's one, it's, it's too hard to look at. You know, as, as people, we generally see like the plight of a child and it's like something horrible happening. We think of our own children mm -hmm. and that hurts. It's so too it's, hard to listen it's to. It's too hard. It's yeah. too hard to listen to. And then also, I mean, I think there's a lot more people involved in it than, than we like to consider. Mm -hmm. And people in power and people who don't want this message out of sexual deviance and where it's derived from especially. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the science behind pornography, it's very unpopular to talk about this it because is. the porn industry is massive mm. and they don't, want it, they don't want you to think that there's anything wrong with this. Um, but the evidence is in that it does create, you know, the brain is stimulated with porn similar to drugs. And just like with marijuana, you used to take marijuana for so long, the brain's gonna, not, not going to have that reaction. It's the chemicals they want, right? They want the brain to give them the dopamine and the endorphins. It's, it's not even about the drug or the naked pit bodies, right? In the end, it's a chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. And that chemical reaction eventually starts to wear down 
as your body becomes more immune to the reaction. Mm. So then that's why someone graduates to to something more serious like coke, cocaine mm-hmm. or you know heroin. Well, the same thing happens in the porn world, right? Mm-hmm. The adult stuff eventually starts to wear off right. and they need the hit. And so they go to like bestiality or they go to children, something just to get the brain going. I've, I've, I've interviewed Ugh. dozens of these guys who we've arrested and they, and they all have a very similar story. Like I can't, they say, I can't believe I'm a, mon- I've a I'm a monster. Mm. I can't believe that I want to engage in sex with seven year olds or eight. I can't believe it, but here's my story. And they get into the, and they tell the story that li- aligns with the science of I, I was so addicted to the dopamine hit of porn, it just wasn't enough mm-hmm. until all of a sudden I'm f- traveling to a high trafficking country to engage in sex with a child because I'm so addicted to the, 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 uh, the, the chemical reaction right. that, m- that my brain can give me. Yeah, I follow that this account, Exodus Cry. I know you've talked about it as well. Isn't that what it's called? Ex- Exodus. They're one of the organizations out there, right? Yeah, yeah, and I I've seen them kind of repost even professors like normalizing pedophilia. Correct. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done some amazing documentaries and work on on this subject. Yeah, it's astounding how. And this is something I wanted I was going to talk about later in the episode, but now that we're kind of talking about it now, it's like it, it's so crazy how there's actually people out there normalize trying to normalize. Oh my gosh, yeah. Sex with children. Yeah. Or attraction to children. Yes. And, and oh man, it's disgusting. And I can see what you're saying, that jump that happens when, when you're in an addictive state. It's it's really disturbing. So can you kind of tell us like where you came from, how you got into this as your like lifelong ca- career passion? Yeah. Like, yeah, what, what's your story? So I always wanted to be in law enforcement and I wanted to be international law enforcement. Um, you know, I, I speak Spanish and I just I love working in foreign countries. And so that's, so I, I signed up and became a special agent with the, the Department of Homeland Security because there all, there's always an international nexus to every case that they work in. But I studied like weapons trafficking and, and, and narco trafficking and um, money laundering and those kind of investigations is what I wanted to work. Um, and six months into my job, this is early 2000s, I was called in and asked if I would help start a child crimes unit within our, our office. And I was like, why me? Like, no, like, no, I'm, I want nothing to do with that. That's, I have the same, I get it. I get the same reaction, you know, people have when they are exposed to this, this topic. So I didn't want to do it. And my wife um, and I had discussed the possibility of ever having to work those, those kind of crimes. And we had decided together that we were not going to do that. Then, um, so I told her that night I came home from work. I said, you won't believe what they just asked me to do. She said, well, the answer is no, because we don't want that darkness in our home. We have little kids and yeah. we don't, you know, who knows what could happen to your mind or. Um, and so I remember the next morning I was kind of like practicing my speech to give to my boss, who was a very intimidating figure to me and tell him, no, I can't do this. And Catherine came in that morning with uh, tears in her eyes and she hadn't slept all night. And she said, I, we're wrong. You know, for the very reason we thought we couldn't do this because we have children is the reason we need to do this because we understand what innocence is and what a child deserves. And if it's true that there's this many children stuck in this, how can we be selfish and not try? So that was it. And then I said yes, and off we went. And you know what? It was about a thousand times worse than I, my mind could have imagined. People would be beyond shocked if they knew what was happening to children. Like the very first case I worked, I was looking at this this, this imagery, these videos of children. Um, just, and I'm I'm afraid even to get. I'm afraid people are turning off the podcast right now, mm, <laughs> right? Because it's so hard. It's so hard. Don't don't turn it off. Yeah. Just hang in there for a little bit because if we don't listen to this, these children have no hope. <sighs> That's it. And so we have to all shed a bit of innocence, right? To 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 engage this fight. Um, but what people are able to do to children, it's just insane. And so we, um, it, it broke me. I mean, I, I the first case I worked, I, I remember running to my kid's school, picking him up, checking him out under some false pretense of the dentist or something. I took him home and just sobbed and held them. I'm like, I can't believe what's going on out there. And um, it was always Catherine, my wife, who was always just reminding me, like, as much as your pain is, like, consider those kids in that video. And where are those kids? Mm-hmm. And that kind of led me to 
Operation Underground Railroad to founding this organization because there's always this question, where are the kids? Hey guys, I chose not to do any sponsorships for this episode. Instead, I'd really just love to use this time to talk about how you can make a direct impact and support Tim Ballard and Our Rescue to expand their efforts and abilities in rescuing more children from sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. They're fighting against a $150 billion industry, so they need all the help they can get. Our Rescue has made a significant impact in this fight by assisting in the rescue of 5,400 survivors and assisted in the arrest of 3,400 predators. The more support they get, the more children are rescued, the more recovery supported, and the more aftercare provided for survivors. For this episode, Andrew and I are doing a special call to action. Your donation can have double the impact because for every donation to Our Rescue made through the link below, we will match it up to $10,000, which means together we can raise $20,000 for Our Rescue. Andrew and I will be making our match donation in August. So if you're listening to this sometime between now and August, you have time for your contribution to make two times the impact. And I want to take a moment to specifically highlight their Abolitionist Club, which is their exclusive community of monthly donors committed to putting an end to modern day slavery, ranging from $5 a month on up. The recurring monthly revenue is the most helpful for our rescue because it allows them to budget effectively from an organizational perspective and plan ahead with how much money they can allocate to their efforts. And the members of the Abolitionist Club receives exclusive content and benefits. So join the members whose combined monthly contributions have supported aftercare and operation efforts in 30 countries around the world and all 50 U.S. states. Click the link below to donate if you're watching on YouTube or find the link in the show notes if you are listening on any listening platform. All right, let's get back to the episode. Most of the videos at the time that we were getting were, were clearly from overseas, even though there's an abundance of production in the United States. But at that time, what we were receiving was overseas. And it was like, how do we get to them? They live in these countries where probably very little or nothing is being done on the law enforcement side. And, um, and then the laws changed in 2006. And that kind of really elevated my, my vision. The laws changed for the first time the United States could investigate and prosecute sex tourists, American men, traveling to foreign countries, engaging in sex with children overseas, we could hold them accountable as if they had committed that crime on US soil. Wow. It was called the Adam Walsh Child Protect Act. Um, before that, we couldn't, we had to, I mean, before that, you had to prove that the, the American sex tourists like, had the intent to do it while standing on US soil which unless they're keeping daily logs of their thoughts, right, right. zero prosecutions. Right. So I was put on this team and I started doing over, overseas work. I went to undercover school and it was just like, okay, now you're going to go way beyond the imagery. You're going in. Mm -hmm. And that's, that opened my eyes to a whole new reality of how accessible children were, especially in developing countries. Mm -hmm. So I was working in places like uh, Central America, the Caribbean, um, Mexico, and then the U.S. government accidentally was like torturing me, right? Because they let me go on these operations and we'd find the kids almost every time. But I had to find the American and with budgetary restraints and things like it was like, you have two weeks oh my or gosh. a week and a half. And I'm like, I, I found the kids and the, and the bad guys think I'm the buyer. Like, yeah, but where's the American? I, I, I don't know. He's not here yet. I, I'm looking. Come home. But oh the kids, my gosh. and it's like they can't redo the case. Like I'm the guy, I'm the guy they trust, the bad guys trust, and so several of those cases, I'm um, having to walk away from them. And then finally, in 2012, I was working a case, two cases, one in Haiti and one in Colombia. One was looking for a little uh, American boy who was of Haitian descent, who had been kidnapped and trafficked in Haiti, and I try, I was trying to make that a U.S. case. And then a case in Colombia where I was really down to consult on a on an investigation and train and instead I kind of made myself I, 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 I uh, committed myself way beyond what I was authorized to do mm -hmm. and we organized this whole big operation that we were going to rescue over 100 kids mm -hmm. so both those cases I was told and, and rightfully so like I don't blame my bosses I would have told myself the same thing Tim this is not a US case I'm sorry you've committed and I even told the boy's father I will never stop until we find your son you know um, so those two cases were pending in 2012 and I was told to walk away. Wow. And then I was like, what do I do? And, it, and that's when Catherine was like, do you think you could rescue kids if you stayed? I said, yes, I know we could, but I can't, I don't have authority. And she's, yeah. so she's like, quit. Under like what you were working with. Yeah. Right. Quit. Let's start it. Let's start a private. We'll do it privately. 
Wow. And it was a crazy leap of faith. December of 2013 is when this happened, and I was scared to death, and we just leaped. And um, the, uh, the author, radio broadcaster, Glenn Beck, was a friend. Uh, well, an acquaintance. We're super close now, but at the yeah. time, he, I was on a show because of a book I wrote about history. It had nothing to do with trafficking, right? And mm-hmm. I reached out to him and kind of told him, hey, I have this idea, and he funded us for the two operations. Wow. And they were super successful. One of the operations yielded, we rescued 26 children. Didn't find a little boy, um, but I found two children who we ended up adopting. So Wow. And then the other case was in Colombia. We ended up rescuing over 120 women and children. Um, and there's a feature film actually coming out about that story called The Sound of Freedom. Uh, so that's, that's it. And that was the beginning of Operation Underground Railroad. And today we're in 30 countries. We've worked in 30 countries. We've worked in every state in the United States. And we provide equipment, technology, training, undercover um, operations, with whatever they need. We, we serve law enforcement and aftercare services around the world to empower them so that they can do their jobs. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, I can imagine how fresh that'd be, like to be doing your job and you're like, I got this, I can I can help these kids and then based on your job restrictions, like you had to walk away. Oh, it was horrible, it was horrible. But I never thought I could sustain it myself, like, because mm-hmm. that's a lot of money. Yeah, you need team, these, you need it. Oh, these operations yeah. are like, they could be 50, 100 more, or more, $1,000 mm-hmm. to hold, the, you know, and it's like, where am I gonna get that kind of money? Right. And and like I looked up the statistics of starting a nonprofit, it was like scared me to death. It was like f- f- like less than five percent make it past the first year, less than three percent make it past the second year. Wow! And I got six kids at the time, and I'm like, this is crazy. Right. I have a really solid, stable job, you yeah. know. And and it was, but it was it was Catherine really, my wife, who was just like, but how are you going to meet your maker? Mm-hmm. Like, do you think you can rescue these kids? Yes. How are you going to go back and meet your maker and say? I didn't do it, mm. and and and, when she, and that was really Ugh. the thing that was like, no, you're right. This yeah. life is so short. Mm-hmm. We have to do what's right, no matter what, and mm-hmm. and that's what, that's what started this. It's amazing. What what was like your aha moment, other than that experience where you realized that you wanted to do this as a lifelong mission, rather than just like a job? So, it was a really specific moment. It's depicted in the film uh, I told you about that's coming up this October, I believe. Um. What happened was it was the first time, it was in 2006, it was the first time that, and I'd been working the, um, in this child crimes anti-trafficking unit for a couple of years, but mostly what we did was the, um, the end user of child exploitation material, or what we used to call child pornography. We don't call it that anymore because most of us feel like that's too light. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's darker than, 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 than that. Um, and um, it was the first time that I had seen a child that we had rescued a child that I had seen in a video and it was a little boy from Mexico who an American man named Earl Buchanan had he he was charged with kidnapping him and others Um, he would take these kids and he had a studio up in up in San Bernardino California he had a studio inside his house where he would film him engaging in sexual activity with these kids and so when I, he came across the, 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 the southern border in, through the Calexico, California, and I was called to the case and was there and saw this little boy that was, had be, was being held in this van. And when I saw him, I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, I know this kid. Wow. And it was, it was devastating in some ways and beautiful in other ways, right? Um, I remember at... At one point, um, well, because we're, we're interviewing this little boy and he's telling me about his sister who this guy had also taken and where was she? So we started, it was July 3rd, 2006. I remember this because the next day was the 4th of July and I had to cancel all our plans or I wasn't going to be able to be with my family. We ended up doing a search warrant on the guy's place on the July 4th on Independence Day, which the symbolism wasn't lost on us. And that's when we discovered that there were 12 other kids um, who he had control of in different ways. And like on the compound. Yes, like he would, sometimes there, sometimes out. He would he would go to um, uh, undocumented families, mm. who he he was a landlord of. He owned a lot of properties, and he would he would give them like discounts, whatever. Wow. But he would give them a threat, like your kids have to come to my home on every weekend, or else I'm going to call the immigration. Oh my gosh! So he would put people in that situation. That's so disgusting. And, and so he got access to these kids. And it, it was that moment when it was just one particular moment. I was, we, we were coming home from San Bernardino, and 
I was trying to find, we were looking for the, 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 the sister, and you know, they'd been trapped all from Mexico to, you know, the, it's, it's a lengthy story. Um, and I had to come back and see the kid uh, to, to interview him further, to see how he was doing, and, and I remember thinking, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go. I remember there's two off ramps in, in the town I lived in, Novell Centro, California, that I was, it's a, t it's a small town, right? So Fourth Street was his, the Betty McNeese Center where he was being, where he was residing, an aftercare home run by the county, and then my, my house was the very next off ramp called Dogwood. And I remember thinking, I was playing this game with myself. I was like, I can't do this. I, I, if I don't turn on 4th Street to see this kid and I go home, that's me signaling I am gonna quit. I'm quitting. I'll, I'll go do, sell real estate with my family or whatever. I can't do this. And something like just forced that hand and I turned off on 4th Street. And it was like this fateful decision because when I went to see the kid, um, it's then that he opened up to me for the first time. And I sat down with him, how you doing buddy, you know, we're talking. And, and he just, in the middle of the conversation, he just stops and runs over to me, like almost like, it was almost unnatural, it's like shocking, like what are you doing? Like he runs over to me and just grabs me and he's shaking and he's just sobbing. Yeah. And he says to me, and he's five years old. I mean, you have you know what a five year old is. Like, oh my gosh. A five year old wouldn't, shouldn't ever have to say this. Mm -mm. And he, he, he <clears throat> said to me, I don't belong here. And, and I knew what he was talking about. But for a five year old to say, I don't belong here, like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I belong with a family. I belong with, you know, I don't belong in the, in, in, in the clutches of this monster. And because he didn't know exactly what was going to happen next or what, what his fate was going to be, right? And, and then he, um, he gives me this necklace. Okay, his sister had given it to him. And um, I was trying to, I was trying to, you know, I was saying, no, this, this is yours. Your sister wants you to have this. Um, it was like a rosary to them. It was this little necklace that said, um, man of God. And his sister would give it to him like, as if like, you know, be brave. We're both going through something really tragic here. She was, she was 12 and he was five. And, um, and he, he gave it to me and he's like, you have to have this. I'm like, no, no, you keep it, you know. And I ended up with it and I ended up going home that night. And I, I remember um, it was like, I'm either gonna dedicate everything to this or I, there's no middle ground anymore. It's, I, I'm in too deep. Like I have to just go full into this and accept all the consequences that come with it or I, got, I, have, to, I have to quit. And it was like this moment with this kid that, that I knew what I had to do. And then I realized the necklace, actually one of my own children pointed out, hey dad, your name's on the necklace. I'm like, what? You know, I had told my son that he was, I think he was about seven or eight years old himself, you know, and he, I told him that the, this little boy gave me this necklace. He says, that's cool that he got your name in there. I'm like, what are you talking about? My name's not on the necklace. And he said, yeah, it's right here. And, and the scripture was from the book of First Timothy, from the Bible that was referenced. So it was like, you know, people might think that's just mystical, whatever crap, but to me it was very significant. It was mm -hmm. providential and it meant something to me. And it was like, this is it. This is my decision. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, years later, when it got to the point where those Columbia case and the Haiti case, that necklace meant everything to me, and that story meant everything to me because I remember I made a promise to myself, to my family, to my God, like this is what I'm doing. And if the right thing is to quit my job to to approach this from a different angle, then then we're gonna do it. And and it really was a huge need, as evidenced by the success that we've had. Huge need. There's gaps everywhere. In, in the systems. Um, human trafficking knows no borders and boundaries. You know, it's, it's the wealthy nations have all this technology, the, the, the developing ones have none, and that's where the kids are being hurt the worst, right? So it was such a need, and we were just, we were there to, to fill it, and then what's so beautiful is, is others who went through a very similar experience that I did. You know, they were willing to shed innocence and support us. And it's just been overwhelming, the light that has come to combat the darkness. And, and the vast majority of the light comes from people like you, people who are listening to this podcast. That's the light that, that sustains us. Uh, and so it's, it's been this journey of like seeing dark, but then also this brilliant light mm -hmm. from, from people who, who, who love children and will do anything to protect them. Right. That's an amazing story. And I think you're right when you're talking about people listening here today. A lot of times you kind of just feel a little helpless. Like, well, what can I do about this information? Right. But 
what is the best thing to do? So there are so many things to do. If you go to our website, um, OURrescue.org, we have, there's a, there's a button on there that says join the fight. And we have lots of ideas how people can get involved. They can do events like what you're doing, like just talking about it, just getting everybody talking, you know, and when we consider, again, I love history, you know, and, and when, when we consider like how, you know, it's, it's, it's unimaginable to me that slavery in its legal form existed for hundreds of years in this country. Yeah. It's grotesque. It's, it's just, I don't get it. Um, but the more important question probably is how did it finally end the legalized form, right? And people think, oh, Abraham Lincoln, he ended it. And, well, kind of. He did, he, did, he did his part, you know, in the window that he was given. And I love him. He's one of my favorites. But it wasn't really him. It was, it was the media. It was people that, you know, they didn't have podcasts and they didn't have movies. And docu- yeah. But they had books and they had tracks and speakers. And for some reason, a group of people got together, mostly the survivor base, like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and others. And they just got loud. They finally organized and got loud um, towards the middle to the end of the 19th century. So much so that when the Civil War broke out, they got Lincoln, they convinced him to make the war about ending human slavery. It was an opportunity that was afforded him. And uh, when he met, when Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe for the first time, right? She was the, she wrote the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, which went viral and, sh- and shined a bright, bright light on the evils of human of slavery, um, he said to her, so you're the lady that wrote the book that started this war. And I love that story because I can look at you and say, so you're the, you're the lady that did the podcast that started this war or you're the guy that made the movie that, you know, that, that, that started this war. Um, and so the more we talk about it, the more media attention we give to this and the more people ask, what can I do? And things start moving. Governments move. I mean, you can rock the foundations of governments by getting loud. That's so true. And it, yeah, it's sorry. It's one of those things where if people aren't talking about something, then the people in power are kind of like, eh. But if enough people care, then something happens. Exactly. So that's why I say to people, make people care. Get loud. Post. Talk. Tweet. Whatever it is. Right. So, okay. Can you walk us through a little bit about like the online explicit material? Like in America, what do you do? How do you catch predators? How do you, what, how do you follow the trail? What's, what's the timeline? So you're talking about specifically because there's different there's different forms of kind of human trafficking or child exploitation that goes on. Sometimes it's the transfer of imagery, videos. Sometimes it's, it's the solicitation. Guys, sickos looking for kids and they go and they prey on uh, minors who have Instagram accounts and they're not paying attention. Um, so there's... I'm so glad you brought this up because in the United States, this, which I imagine the vast majority of your fault, your, your listeners are from, uh, this is where it begins. Like if we go to other countries, it's different. Not, not, not totally different, but it's more exposed. It's more in your face. Um, but in the United States, it's mostly begins online. And um, you, you see people that are preying on children. They're looking for the vulnerable. They're looking for the girl on Instagram who is, 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 talking about um, how she is, you know, not valued or she feels no confidence. Well, that's, they know they can pray and they start, you, you, they start, we've seen this, right? Where they start saying things like, Hey, you're beautiful. Why don't you, you know, I, I'm an agent or I'm a photographer or I'm a, and they just lure your kid and they'll, they'll, they can pretend to be anything they want to pretend to be. They'll pretend, pretend to be the 14 year old boy that relates to this 13 year old girl. Right. And then they have a fake, you know, uh, online persona, and they can lure them out. There's there's a lot of cases like that. Um, another thing that we see, um, uh, because it's not always just kids who are suffering in a bad family environment. We see this other thing called Romeo trafficking, which is very scary and happens to kids who are in great families, right? So what happens is they. They end up dating some kid, some guy. They have sex. He does a sex tape. They break up two months later, and then he's got leverage. Mm. And it's, hey, guess what? I have, um, look at the video I have. If you don't continue sexually servicing me and my friends or whatever, this is going out. Or, hey, you, if you don't pay me X, Y, and Z, or if you don't do X, I'm put. look, oh, I have the email list of your entire church congregation, your grandparents, the school. All I, all I have to do is push send. 
we're seeing a lot of this. It's like it's like it's, uh, it's wow. like, um, extortion, right? Mm-hmm. Sextortion, they call it. Um, and it's derived out of what starts as a, you know, a seemingly happy relationship with your the high school football team member, whatever, right? It's just, and so we see a lot of cases like that. And so parents need to be very in tune to who their kids are dating and what's going on and, and what access they have online. Um, even little little kids, this is another thing, is the gaming, right? Parents, at least my age and older, okay, this person probably doesn't relate to you, but like if you're my age or older, like we didn't have the internet as teenagers at all. Like, and so we don't know what it's like to be in that kind of unstable time of development and have to be dealing with the challenges that come on, on the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's this education gap and parents don't get it. Like, I had no idea that my kid was playing Fortnite and talking to someone. There's a message board. There's a communication board. Right. Like, oh my gosh. You know, we had a case, there was a case in, in, in Salt Lake City not long ago where this guy was gaming with two five and six year old girls uh, uh, from Indiana. Okay. And it was like some little kid game and he was pretending to be another kid. Parents had no idea. It was during COVID and lockdowns and they weren't, they're like, just play games over here, girls, whatever. This guy had like step by step, like walked them through how to take their clothes off, take pictures of them, of their of their, you know, their private parts and sent to him. Oh my gosh. And, and the parents, they, we, they said, we had no idea this game had a way that someone could communicate with our kids. And so it's, it's just stuff like that where parents are just like, they have to know. You've got to know what apps are on your kid's phone or computer, what games. Turn off the, the function, the messaging function. Don't let them have, be exposed, you know, to the outside world. Um, so that a lot of it is just knowledge can end, can prevent the, the, tragic you know possibilities yeah and it's become so normalized to give your kids a smartphone and a tablet and ipad at such a young age and it's scary i feel like it's just hardly anyone cares about it i'm like does anyone care about this like this is scary how much information they have access to and what could potentially cause a lot of harm but because it's really convenient and we live in such a fast-paced world and everyone else is doing it it's just become so normal when really even when i was growing up we didn't have like you know social media and apps and stuff like that or smartphones but there was still like the computer and if parents weren't paying attention what young kids um, could end up getting into you know is it could potentially be devastating in regards to addiction that forms down the road now imagine what happens when they have a smartphone and there's all those insecurities that take place like you're just explaining that's crazy yeah i mean it's like the the, the 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 addictive power and destructive power of pornography cannot be overstated. And when we give our kids iPhones, it's like we just gave them a pile of Playboys. Like mm-hmm. for, that's would be my generation. Mm-hmm. And even then, we didn't understand the power of it because even then, those pages didn't have really the power that videos do. And, yeah, it's way different. And people are it's it's really creating brain damage in our kids, you know. And and you know, my I've got nine kids, six boys. So I'm, you know, I'm constantly catching my kids looking at inappropriate things and I, I'm trying to teach them, like, let me tell you what can happen to you. Mm-hmm. You don't, you, you do not want to become addicted to this material and mm-hmm. that's what will happen. And then my kids push back, well, okay, dad, how many people actually get to that mm-hmm. place where they want it, they, it turns into pedophilia? And like, not, not many. It's like drinking alcohol, like how many become like hardcore alco- alcoholics? A small percentage, but still enough in this world of sex addiction that there's two million children being forced into the commercial sex trade. But then I take it further to them and, and show them the science and there's been lots of research done on just, you know, and this gets boys too. It's You, you scare the, the heck out of them, right? So if you get addicted and your brain starts becoming damaged, like there's examples of guys who married these beautiful women, good looking dudes, you know, they were the, you know, popular kids, whatever, and, and think, you know, everything seems to be happening for them. They can't have sex. They get married, they have a honeymoon, and they can't, their, their stuff doesn't work. They're numb. Yeah, they're numb to it because you want something else. It's not a real relationship. You want something fake that the porn, the porn industry has created, this counterfeit that's not real, and you'd rather sit there and masturbate and look at that than make love to your wife. And you won't even be able to get it up. There's so many problems, I think, within pornography that even if it's not child exploitation, there's exactly. a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so that seemed to hit a, like a nerve with Mike boys. Like, wait, what? 
I, I want to be married. I want to have sex. I want. I'm like, is it too late, Dad? I'm like, no, no, no. It's not too late. You're not. You're not that far. But like, we need to teach our kids this. It's and it's science. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is. You can go to. There's a site called uh, FightTheNewDrug.org. It's an organization that's about educating people on on the power of pornography and how it does work like a drug. And I think that it's we would all do well to make sure our kids understand that and talk freely. That's the other problem. Parents aren't talking to their kids. They're embarrassed to talk about. Like it's easy for me. I'm, I've been an undercover operator in the right. sex world. They I can know say this is your job. I yeah. can say anything, and it, I'm no blush. But you have to be open. And when that time is, y- your intuition has to tell you when mm-hmm. it is. I think each kid is different. But you've got to have an open relationship and open you know, uh, means of communication to the point where you, if your kids see something or are struggling, they have no problem coming to you. Mm. Hey, mom, I'm kind of like looking at porn a lot and you know, whatever. And then yeah. it's like, okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's. The problem is I think most parents just like, give them the phone, like you said, it's easy, convenient, and it's just like, I don't really want to talk about sex. And then, okay, you're going to let, uh, uh, you know, some porn site teach your kid about sex. Mm-hmm. And that's not, and they're going to teach them the wrong thing, right? So, um, more engagement yeah. we need on the, on the parental yes. side. <laughs> yes, and even there's so many problems with young kids having smartphones aside from even just pornography, like just the insecurities that come about, yes. face filters, which I've talked about in my podcast before, the way that affects your self-image, your, your view of self-worth, especially with like a developing brain. Yeah, we I have major problems with like young kids having smartphones yeah. and yeah. access to all of it. I understand like, you know, you're going to have a game with your dad, you play a, like a video game here and there, but... Like those are good I- advice about like the messaging, turning off the messages. Yeah. So what about um, predators who are pedophiles exchanging um, online explicit content? How do you go about our, how does our rescue go about uh, catching these predators? And do you work with the government? Are you like on consignment with them? How do you do it? So we support, we support government. We support law enforcement agencies dedicated to, to finding this stuff, right? So there's amazing software out there that has been developed by different brilliant minds that has been able to go in and identify um, child exploitation material. Um, you, you get into the dark net especially and when people are exchanging it, there's, there's codes, right, that they, they can talk to each other and send messages. And so law enforcement over the years has been able to collect a massive amount of, of um, child exploitation material, millions, like because they seize it and they hold these libraries. So now they, they are, they're able to then use that to go into these places, in the dark net especially, and identify where that image is now being sent and mm. transferred. And then they can track it. And it's all, it's all open. It's, it's not a Fourth Amendment kind of privacy issue because the dark net, these places, they're public, they're public spaces. Mm-hmm. It's, they're public spheres. Anyone can go in and look around. Right. And so there is software available that's just like, it's like almost virtually, right? They can, it's like law enforcement can walk in and be like, oh, you just sent and you just received. And I, and I can now find out where both your addresses are and I can go do warrants on your, like it's that fast, it's that amazing. Um, so we, one of the things we do is we find law enforcement agencies who don't have that and we train them. We get them the training on it. We fund the training. Um, we buy them the digital forensic uh, computers the labs like for example in 2014 we went into thailand and at the time there was very little uh, being done about child exploitation material which is devastating being that this is one of the hot the hottest kind of uh you know zones for for sex trafficking and um so we were able to go in and help them build what i believe is their like their their first digital forensic laboratory today we have 24 25 full-time people mostly thai national then we have a fusion center um, where we have all the equipment, all the digital forensics, all the capabilities, and then the law enforcement agencies come to our office and sit down and use our stuff, and we give them leads, and then they ask us to help with X, Y, and Z. They bring us on their warrants. We go in and do the digital forensics, and so that's how we do it. We support them with all the tools and technology, and we have all of it. All the new developing stuff, we have it, and we 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 make it available. So So often there's um, a lack of budgets for this kind of stuff. And it, what's tragic about child crimes... I mean, there's many things, but one of the tragic things is it's a proactive investigation, right? It's not, these cases generally, sometimes they do, but generally they don't fall on your desk. They don't fall into your lap, like a homicide or a bank robbery where something happens and you have to respond, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and with, someone's reporting it. Right, someone's right. reporting it. You have to respond. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen generally 
a child crime, you got to go out and find it. Yeah. You have to be proactive. We, you know, we're called Operation Underground Railroad for a reason. Yeah, because the children are voiceless. And, exactly. And no one's speaking up for them. Exactly. And so it takes a lot of proactive measures. Well, what are the if, if there's a limited budget to a law enforcement agency, what's the first to go? The proactive investigations because, like you just said, it, no one's reporting it. Mm. So no one knows what they didn't know kind of thing. You can't stop on the homicide. You can't stop on the bank robberies. But you can stop on the child crime because no one knows what they don't know. Mm. Right? That makes sense? Yeah. And so we were freaking, I was freaking out during this whole defund the police stuff. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, my whole job before that was to fund the police because unless they're funded, they'll never get to the proactive stuff, which means those kids have no hope of being rescued. So our job is to fund the police and get them what they need, the training technology, resources, whatever it is, and and uh, and make sure they they're empowered. Also, aftercare services, because that's even more important. Like once you get the kid out, you better have a plan, right, for how they're going to be rehabilitated, reintegrated into society. Are they, are they ever reunited with their family? For yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And that happens is a beautiful thing when the family didn't know and the the, the kid was taken. Um, oftentimes the family more often than I want to even admit, right, um, or, or recognize the families are part of the problem. Mm. Um, oftentimes, usually these predators know how to prey on kids. They're not going to prey on a stable family, generally, right? It, it can happen, but they're going to find the family where there's not a father or there's not a mother or they're being raised by like an old grandma who's not really capable. That's, or they're struggling financially. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's they know how to prey on that. That's why we see, you know, it's it's not generally the cold kidnapping you see in the movie Taken, right? Right. People ask me, is that what it's like? Well, the environment where the where the girls end up, yes, it's it's not that's that's it's not too far from the truth. Like how that kind of plays mm -hmm. out, how they're sold for sex and so forth. But they're generally not going to do a a cold like just a rip kidnap, okay. right? Because these are businessmen. That's bad for business. Mm -hmm. As the movie take, have you seen movie taken? Yeah. So as the movie shows you, right? It's like that's bad for business because you got you got Liam Neeson now running after you. Yeah, right? yeah. And, you know, kind of metaphorically speaking, that's the same thing. Like, you, 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 a cold kidnapping is going to alert more. Mm -hmm. So it's a lure. It's a business move. So they'll go to impoverished areas. They'll go to the highlands of Guatemala, say, and, and promise a job to a 13-year-old girl whose family is struggling. Hey, she can be the nanny at our house. And in fact, we'll give her an education, too. And, hey, you can talk. Here's a cell phone. And, and, it's the and most then, vulnerable that they're Oh, yeah, and the after. family's like, oh, you know, our ship just came in. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's $300 just to... And, and the families have no idea, and they think that they're, you know, they think that their kid is gonna make it, and then that kid disappears, and they never see that kid again. And what's the recourse? Who are they gonna call? Who's gonna do anything? Nobody. They don't have recourse. So that's that's generally how trafficking works. It's a lure. It's it's not the white van that comes up and snags a kid out of the street, you mm -hmm. know. And we do a disservice by painting it that way, because yeah. then people don't realize, like like this extortion stuff, the Romeo trafficking, the lures, that. That's the most prominent type, and so if we don't talk about it, we we won't be prepared to defend against. And it. And maybe that's another reason why it's not prominent in the news because it's not a it's not sensational for the media exactly. when it's not some wealthy middle class family that has that their child was kidnapped from a window, right? Like that makes the news. Exactly. But if it's like a child from a really at need vulnerable family, and they go they go missing or they were right. handed off voluntarily because they thought it was something right. different. Because the story make... is the kid wanted to go. The kid's probably happy somewhere. Don't worry about it. And it's not a story. When in fact the most egregious things are in the end happening to them. <laughs> yeah. But the story doesn't fit the mindset sometimes. Wow. And so we have to change that. Right. So what is the process of rescuing these kids then? Both in, like, how often do you rescue kids in America versus internationally? So our work um, domestically is very different. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's um, limited to training and equipment and um, empowering law enforcement. When we go overseas, they ask us often to do more. Like we have more proactive, they'll deputize us basically. And we will be, like for example, I just came back from Ukraine where our teams and our partners are deputized to go extract children from war zones, prevent before traffickers get to them. So we literally are like driving in and, and pulling kids out. Um, or we'll go in, in, in a lot of Latin American countries we work in, they'll ask us to pose as um, sex tourists, American sex tourists, because we are, we look like what the, what the traffickers are trying to serve us. Prototype, yeah. So we can get really quick into the brothels that are selling kids in the back and you know, so it's very different. In the U.S., we don't have that. They have a, a, a plenty of undercover operator, operators that can do that kind of work. 
Um, but we provide really cool tools that, that uh, kids are getting rescued constantly from these tools. Um, and bad guys are going down constantly. I'd say even weekly um, with the tools we have out there. Um, one of the tools, I don't know if you've seen this, is our ESD dogs, electronic storage device dogs. Mm -hmm. So these, these are, it's a very new tool. Um, Operation Underground Railroad has, um, has deployed more of these dogs than anyone else that we know of. And we're, we're going to get our first international dog. I think we're sending one to Thailand, uh, one to Colombia. So we work with um, an organization um, called, it's a, it's a, a Todd Jordan Protection, Canine Protection, where he trains these dogs. And then we, we build like, we, we built the barn and we, we fund it and we find the law enforcement that need it. So these dogs like bomb sniffing dogs or drug sniffing dogs, these dogs can smell this component that's in every single electronic storage device, whether it's like the mini SD cards, thumb drives, big computer, whatever it is, cell wow. phones. And so when law enforcement roll up on a warrant, based on, for example, the software I was telling you about where you can go into the dark net, right? That leads to a warrant, but you still gotta prove it. You gotta, pr you gotta prove the guy has the material. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the material he has is the only evidence that there's a child and who that child is. Mm. So it's very important we get it right. But they can go into a house and these guys are getting, they know they're doing something super illegal. People are going down every day in the news for this, right? So they hide their stuff on a little tiny SD card, right? Inside a inside a false space in a book in a, in a bookshelf you know you, they'll do that they'll yeah. hide it and i've seen it hidden in floorboards wow up in curtains you know whatever false compartments in a desk well no no longer can they pull that off because these dogs go in and they it's 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 like this glue it's the glue that's used inside a microchip wow and the dogs just go they'll just signal right on it and like do their little thing they'll tap they'll bark whatever it is and then they they they, they find it and then inside that that storage device, like I said, it's you'll find the child exploitation material, and if you're lucky, identifiables to be able to go and rescue that child. Yeah. So how do you, if you identify the child, how do you go figure out where that child is? So every law, law, law enforcement agencies have different mechanisms. One of the coolest is the former agency that I worked for. Um, they were just getting started on this when I left. It's called the Victim Identification Program. Um, and they work with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children as well. So you get that imagery over to them, and they take it, and they can like expand it, focus it, narrow it, and all of a sudden they'll like see like in the background a T-shirt mm. that says Joe's Ice Cream. And look it up. And Where's Joe's Ice Cream? Well, there's only three places that have Joe's Ice Cream, right? And then they'll see another picture from that same series, and it shows like a field. Okay, so which Joe's ice cream? And, and there's a field, you know, and then it's got narrow, narrow, and then they end up at the house, and there's the kid. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. It's amazing. That is so amazing. Yeah, that's Homeland Security Investigations, the C3, that has that uh, victim identification that's unit. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit. Can you talk about your recent trip to Ukraine and what you did there, how it relates to human trafficking? Just kind of explain what you saw and what you yeah, did. Yeah, so um, it's devastating what's happening in Ukraine. Um, this is, I wish people would wake up to this. This is, uh, you know, we've seen this in Europe before, and it led to things like World War II, right? The Cold War. But you, you got a, a, a crazy man who is taking over a, a, a sovereign nation. If he, if he gets it, he'll go on. Now, why do I say crazy? Because people are like, oh, no, I like him, blah, 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 Putin, whatever. Because we're there on the ground, and I see what they're doing. Like, they, they can't... They can't take the capital, right? Which is super embarrassing. The superpower can't take the capital of a small state. Um, and so in frustration, what they're doing is they'll turn their tanks and just start blowing up towns, children. We got one report where they the, the, the orphanage workers, I can't prove this, this report that we got, I believe it, but they wrote on the top of the roof in Russian, there's children here. Like, so... If you're gonna bomb, don't bomb that. Right. You know, thinking that there's a soul right. on, the other, on the receiving end of that message. Right. Instead, they said, "Oh, well, there's our target." Boom! It's a war of terror. They can't get. They can't make. It, they can't militarily, conventionally, you know, using conventional tactics, get in and take this capital, take the government down. And so they're using terror tactics, which is we're gonna scare the hell out of you people so much that you're gonna have to capitulate. And so they're blowing up neighborhoods. They're just taking aim. And I'm, I was there. I see it. I saw it. I saw it. Um, and so we, um, we we were working with a, a, a close partner organization called um, Aerial Recovery Group, and they we work with them in the Caribbean and other places. And so early on, 
Actually, it's a crazy story. I, it was in February, just before the invasion, I got a phone call from Mel Gibson. Uh, Mel Gibson's one of the producers of the film Sound of Freedom, and he's, he was in Budapest filming. And he said, hey, Tim, if they invade, if Russia invades, like, what's hap- what happens to all the kids? I'm like, yeah, that's a really good question. He's like, I got all these orphanages that me or my friends are supporting out there, and he started giving me all these names. So we start making phone calls and getting partners on the ground, and Aerial Recovery is made up of a bunch of uh, former uh, like Green Berets. Right, who they know how to work in the, that kind of environment. So they got in there, and then and then OUR is now part of it as well. And we're signing an MOU, uh, I think this week with the anti-trafficking unit of of uh, in, in Ukraine, and we have this this um, MOU signed with the Child Protection Services. So we are literally our teams are are assigned to go in and extract um, these children. So they give us a list of like here's the ten thousand orphans that we think are in war zone right now. Like, go in and get them. So like, our teams are going in with, I mean, during airstrikes, I mean, we're, we're missiles overhead. We, we can hear the explosions right going off, and we go in to the orphanage, fill the bus up we have, and get them out and take them to the west and put them into safe houses there. And then where OUR stepping in now, big time, is we are now going to help the police kind of do proactive investigations similar to what I just told you about about how you go in and find these guys and so it's the software, the technology. Why? Because there's, whenever there's chaos, there's, it's, it's crazy vulnerable for children, right? Because the, the children are, mispl- are displaced. Sometimes their parents are dead. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, they, and so they end up alone and they're vulnerable to human traffickers. And where we learned this was in, um, where, where I first learned it, big, in, in a very real way, was in 2010 when there was a, that mass earthquake in Haiti, which killed about, I think, a quarter million people, like immediately were dead, which meant there's at least that many or more children now vulnerable. And what we saw happen there was people started just, traffickers just, it's harvest time. So they come down there and they just put like uh, orphanage, they'll paint orphanage on the side of a compound, of a wall, of a ha- building. And so innocent people are like picking up kids. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and two little kids, a one and two year old kid, were crying over the dead bodies of their parents. And this nice woman picked them up and said, come with me. She doesn't know what to do with them, but she said, oh, there's an orphanage there because it says orphanage. Took the kids there. Um, that happened before I, the little boy I told you about. Now, his name is Gardy. This is going to come back to Ukraine, I promise. Okay. But this little boy, Gardy, yeah, that was his name, who was kidnapped, U.S. citizen, but he was kidnapped in Port-au-Prince. So he was taken to the same, uh, he was kidnapped in December of 2009. Two weeks later, the earthquake hits, Okay. So he's taken to uh, that same false orphanage where those two kids that were, and there's like a dozen other kids there in that same situation. So when we went in looking later, a couple years later, for the little boy, we found that false orphanage. And we were able to go undercover, um, and they tried to sell us those two little kids that I just referenced. So we bought them in a sting operation. Now those two kids are the two kids I ended up adopting. Wow. So they've been, they're home, they've, they're my children now. Oh my gosh. For three years. That's so crazy. Um, and we never found the little boy. We're still looking for him. But we've done dozens of rescue operations in Haiti, so much of which began with this horrible situation in Haiti. The, the earthquake created all these trafficking victims that we're now years later still trying to get back. Um, and I'm reminded every day of it because I have two kids who lived it. So I always regretted that OUR wasn't around in 2010. Like, and I vowed, like, the next time something like this happens, we're going to be there. We're mm-hmm. going to be in the, we're going to intervene. And so when Ukraine happened, it's like, here's our chance. We can go right now, and we're going to go right now. Um, so last week, I was, um, I, was, I was there. I mean, the operations have been going for a while, and I decided it was, it was getting big enough. I need to go check in on it to see how much more we're going to continue this or not or, you know, whatever. So we got in there and we did this operation. It was, it was very routine. Um, they're all like very dramatic and crazy and you know dangerous. But it was routine because we're doing them like once or twice a week. Um, so we went into um, this little town called Chernihiv, which is near the border of Russia. And on our way, on our way in to get these kids who our horses on the ground said needed to get out, um, we just got word. This was on Good Friday. Okay, so this was just like a week and a half ago or whatever. Um, that's why we call it Operation Good Friday. So um, so we get word that the Ukrainians had just sunk 
the flagship battleship of the Russians in the Black Sea called the Moscow, which is super embarrassing to them. So in retaliation, like I said, this is a war of terror, um, they decided to take aim at the closest civilian population to where the Ukrainian missile that took out the ship was. And where was it? Chernihiv, right where we were heading. So it was like, oh my gosh, do we go for it? What do we do? And we just kind of gathered our thoughts and prayed and just all felt good. Like, nope, we're going to go right in the middle of it. So we went into Chernihiv on Good Friday. We found the kids, got them out, and got them to safety. But what, what was crazy, again, in light of the fact, and I'm a person of faith, you know, and I look for signs like, you know, I look for God's hand <laughs> in things. I just do. And, and it was so crazy. The first kid that we found in Chernihiv on this operation we, um, that we put on the bus, and I asked him, I said, what's, what's your name? And he said, my name, in Ukrainian, he said, my name is Gardi. What? And I was like, wait, say it again? Like, I, got, I had to put my phone, what's your name? He said, my name is Gardi. Wow. So I, I had him spell it. It was like, just, just there's an I. And he's like, why are you freaking out about my name? Yeah, and so <laughs> I, I, I talked to Ukrainian officials. I'm like, is that a pretty popular name here? Like, I've, they, they said, we've never heard that name. That's a very crazy, unique name. That is so chilling. It was, it, for me, it was, because it was like, you know, here we get to do what we couldn't do, that we weren't there for in 2010. Here we are. And to me, it's just God talking to me like, yep. Oh my God, you're going to you're, cry. You're supposed to be here. <laughs> wow, that's so, crazy. Yeah. That is so crazy. And so there's, do, there's, I told you earlier, right, there's this little documentary we're putting together. Mel Gibson's going to narrate it, because mm -hmm. I called Mel after this. I said, I told him the story. I said, I FaceTimed him from Ukraine. He's looking at the team. I'm like, look what you started, man. It's like, you, you got to narrate this documentary. He's like, oh, I'm in. Come, let's, let's do it. So, so we're going to try to get this thing out by end of May to show the world what is happening. What's it going to be called? Operation Good Friday. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. So what are you frustrated about? You said it in the beginning that you were frustrated with the news. What, I'm what frustrated because about? there's so many people, in, including a lot of people that I l listen to and respect, that are just like, they're somehow almost ambiguous about this. Like, oh, Ukraine's so corrupt. And, and again, I have very good friends who, who run shows. And I'm like, I, I, great. And they're, they're not, they're not a, I'm sure they support us in rescuing children. But what, what concerns me, I'm more of, it's not my business really, or yours business to get like the, in the, the geopolitical situation of what's going on. But it's like, this is a really bad person that's doing really bad things with the power he has, Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. He's going into a sovereign nation and blowing up civilians mm -hmm. and taking aim at children. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not an accident. This is not like, oh, sorry, crossfire collateral damage. Mm -hmm. This is, crap, I can't get into Kiev, so I'm going to turn the tanks and just blow up this neighborhood, okay, and, and try to convince. And, and so I just don't, there's, there's no moral ambiguity here. Because yeah, you're at the heart of it, you're like, I just want to rescue these kids. I want to make sure these kids right. don't become trafficked. And so you see like a, a, a bigger problem here rather than like playing political. Right. And, and everyone can agree, Tim, go, we, we will support you doing that. But I'm looking more long term. Like, I do want to point out that this is this was an absolute invasion, an, an evil act upon innocent people. Right. I don't care how corrupt Ukraine's been in the past or whatever. Like, what country, our country's corrupt. Like, you can't have a tyrant running around gobbling up countries because I know what happens to the kids every time, right? And, and that's just one of the of a million problems that comes from, from this. And so I just, it's not morally ambiguous to me. Like, it seems to be to so many people like, well, whatever. No, it's not, well, whatever. It's, 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 a, it's a tyrant dictator coming in and wreaking havoc and, and bringing hell to, na to a nation. And if, if he's successful there, he will move on. Mm -hmm. He's trying to recreate the, the, the Soviet Union, for hell's sake. Like, this is not going to end pretty. And so I, I just, I wish everyone could just, I just, I feel like everything's so political on both sides where it's just like. Yeah, it gets extreme both sides. Right. If this person's doing something, support it. And I'm, if I'm conservative and Biden's going to actually support it with $800 million, I can't be for it. Why? Why can't you be for it? Why can't you be, like, for an obvious evil right. being taken out? Yeah. Take, because, yeah, take and it's really hard for me being on the ground. And then I came out mm -hmm. and. Days later, I ran into a really good friend of mine who starts telling me that Putin's the good guy here and, Z and Zelensky's the bad guy. I'm like, what? what? I, I just saw it with my own eyes, you know? Um, so I, I just, I wish people could just focus on truth and stop being political. Like, yeah. stop choosing a side, these tribal wars, red versus blue. Like, totally. I'm so tired of it mm -hmm. because I've seen the, the children, child, child trafficking has been politicized this way. Mm. And it's, it's crazy because Trump 
put three hundred million dollars down range. It's really there's, there's there's an equivalent here, right? Yeah. Or but, I I saw someone when you you did a post that like Candace Owens is gonna support a gala, and someone's like, oh, bad choice. It's like, mm-hmm. well, what? She's wanting to help end human trafficking. Right. Like, put the other stuff aside that you don't like about her. Like, let's oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. I saw those. Um, she's hosting our gala next week or two in two weeks, whatever. Because she's very passionate about fighting human trafficking. She has a voice. And it's like, people are like, unfollowing. Yeah. Like, okay. Like, <laughs> you just unfollowed a group that's rescuing children. Okay. Yeah. Good, good jo- like, who yeah. are you? Like, you know, I, I told you the story yesterday where I, when I Trump, I, I, I had the opportunity to brief President Trump. And probably right now there's people on your podcast going, I'm turning this off. He's, he just said the F word. That's Trump, right? It's just like, wait, wait, just calm down. Listen for a second. Listen, everybody. Don't turn, don't turn me off. Okay. I was asked to go to the White House and brief President Trump on human trafficking. I would have gone just as fast and said the exact same words to Obama, Bush, Biden, anybody. It didn't matter to me. We work in, we've worked in 30 countries and there's all sorts of weird people who are presidents and whatever. Yeah. I don't. Whoever's in power is the one I'm going to talk to because that's the power to rescue children, and that's what I want everybody thinking yeah. that way. Unfortunately, I, I didn't know it was going to be televised, but they televised this. I was in the cabinet room briefing the president. You can go look it up. You can watch the briefing. And I stand by everything I said. And the next day, my financial department called me and said we just lost a thousand recurring donors. We have something called the abolitionist program, where um, it's it's recurring donors, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we need that because that helps us project budgets because we know the money's coming. A thousand of them left. Wow. And, and All because of that, because you talked to him. Because I talked to Trump. Because you're trying to help end I'm trying to, trying trafficking. To, yeah, I had solutions for how to end human trafficking. With well, someone who has power to help right. do something. And he was actually doing something. He, he had deployed a $300 million to, to aftercare and human trafficking. And really, his Ivanka Trump was the one really the passion behind it. I'd met with her a couple times and so it was like awesome. We're doing we're doing something. This is awesome. And it was awesome when the, when the Democrats were doing stuff about it too. It was always bi- bipartisan, right? It's right. like who, it should be. It should be. It definitely right? should be. So they're they're like, Tim, call these donors, at least the big ones, and tell them. Tell them that you are not this is not political. You would have said the same thing to any other administration. And and I said, No, I'm not gonna call any of them because they signaled to me a message that they hate one person or one party more than they love rescuing children from a life of rape. Mm. And if that's who you are, and if you just canceled us because we have Candace Owens hosting, if that's who you are, you are a person that you have some serious problems. Serious problems, right? That you'd stop supporting us from rescuing children, again, from a life of rape because you hate some ideology. This has to stop in our country. And it's and 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 it's 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 gonna be our it seriously will be our end if this continues. Sorry, I'm tearing up right now because it's so true. Like I can't stand like the polarization so much, and it's like, can we just get together? It sounds so silly that I'm like crying about this. No, I feel this. I feel very passionate about it too. Yeah, because it's and you can see your passion in it and how frustrating it is because you just want to help kids and how easily people just want to look to the like left right obsessive right. like who's evil good instead of realizing like the common goal exactly yeah and i always hoped i always used to say the last thing on the table the last thing on the table that everybody from every side from every creed and political agenda whatever could agree on is children shouldn't be raped and i still have that hope that that's the belief it's just what what happens is when your side is against it or for it whatever then you have to be against it. So what they've what they're doing is now is trying to make it like human trafficking is not a real thing. Yeah. And they, they manipulate the, the because the, one the side's data. talking about it and then the other right. side's like trying to laugh about it almost. Exactly. <laughs> Which is weird. Exactly. It doesn't it's, make sense. And that's not to say the other side doesn't care about it. It's just the way that the media is portraying things. Yeah. Because at the heart of it, even I mean, even when you're talking about Putin, right? Like it's so sensitive because there are like Russia doesn't mean Russians who are in Russia are this but the but the way that it's kind of being depicted is just like russia and so i think that's probably why there's the the sensitivity behind like labeling russia as this or that because all these wonderful russian people are like behind this and being like well look we're not standing for you know bombing civilians and stuff and oh and they're protesting too by the way there's a lot of them in in, in russia that are protesting what they're doing and they're being silenced and yeah, Bad things are happening. and a lot of times it's just like people who are in power and the way that there's like polarization, labeling, grouping people good or bad instead of like just coming to together in the way that you're explaining. I just, I, you know, George Washington 
warned us not to go, not to have political parties. It's not in the Constitution. It's not. We just made them. And it was. It's devastating. It never should have happened, because now we just. I'm Republican. I am going to believe everything the Republicans. Or I'm Democrat. I'm going to believe every. It's so stupid. Yeah. There's there, guys. Come on. Every issue is so different, and it's like just look for truth. Yes. Whatever it is, and and ask yourself what it is, right? And do that thing. Yeah. And then and then we'll start making right decisions as a people, and and you know kids won't get caught in the in the crossfire of these. Political, political battles games yeah. yeah because a lot of times it tends to be like oh i think this way on one p- p- political issue so that must mean i agree with everything right. on that political issue but that hey, you do not have to do that you could right. you could agree with this uh, this particular and then this particular sure. and this on different sides and when we when one person talks about a particular thing and then lumping you must be all these other things because you said you agree with this one thing and this one side it's astounding and just atrocious yes and it gets us nowhere right i did an episode called the problem with wokeness with uh this girl named Africa. Brooke and she talks a lot about that on her social media about how the problems with even if you come out having a problem with wokeness but then you go to the other side the other side can be just as extreme and just as ridiculous in their just tunnel vision of things and so that's why this Absolutely. conversation is so important and I can see I think I was tearing up because I see your passion how frustrating it is that you just want to create change and it doesn't matter who is willing to help right. you're like if someone's willing to help I'm going to be like let's do it yeah wow Okay, so when is the documentary coming out? So we hope it's going to be out really soon. We're trying to turn it around quick, like by June. We hope to get it out. Um, it'll probably be 30, 40 minutes. And we should have a trailer coming soon, and I'll, I'll send it to you so you can you can put, post it if yeah, you Yeah, for like. sure. I will definitely so. be putting that link below um, once it comes out. And It's a quick turnaround. We usually, we've, we've had documentaries made about us that take like a year or two, but this is like, no, we got to do it now because this is a crisis now. We need people to know now, so... So we're, we're going to do it. Glenn Beck is producing it. Mel Gibson is going to be narrating it. And it's going to tell this story of what we're doing right. in Ukraine. Why do you think the news has kind of settled down a little bit with, about the Ukraine and Russia situation? I think people's attention spans are just like, you know, <laughs> yeah. they just, okay, done with that. What's the next thing? So we've got to keep it front and center. And, and, and to us, really, the, you know, I, I, I weigh in. I, I consider the political aspects. But really, it's just, it's just these kids. That's it. There's 10,000 kids on a list, and we've been able to get just under 700 out so far. And where do they go? So the, we, we work closely with the, um, with the Child Protection Services, and they have homes, safe houses, Airbnbs in the western part of the country. Um, and we're exp- we have to expand that now, so we're looking for other houses that we can buy up or rent out, and we, and we take the kids there. The, the one place we took the kids, this will be in the documentary, is crazy. Um, a bunch of kids that, we had, that our team had had rescued, um, we took them this past Easter, we took them out to have fun at this like fun game house, you know, um, like a Chuck E. Cheese kind of place, you know. And uh, and it was so fun, that's how we celebrated Easter, you know, and then, and then the next morning, um, we thought we were kind of safe in this western part of the country. Um, and the next morning, there was six Russian missiles that hit the city. One was a, hit a mile from my bed Another hit a, a mile from the orphanage house where the kids we had just been with the day before, and there was an air raid siren, so everybody got under the in the basement, or whatever, and no one no one died luckily, but all the windows just blew out of the of the orphanage, and so now we're just like okay, we got to start moving, we got to start moving these kids, so we're collecting all these kids. It's pretty soon it'll be a thousand, then two thousand, three thousand. There's a hundred thousand plus registered orphans in Ukraine. It's one of the highest orphan. Um, populations in the world. We don't this really know why. This was pre the war. Before the war. So now there's even more kind of chaos. And um, so now it's not just re- collecting and extracting. Now it's like moving them. There may come a time when the governments decide, the Ukraine decides they want to move them to a safe place outside the country, which is a very risky proposition. We, we don't get involved with that at all. But we, we wouldn't want those kids to get lost or be compromised by some other government. We, we have a project at OUR called Children Need Families. I don't know if you're familiar with that project. I heard about it, but talk about it. So my wife, Catherine, started it. And it's basically, when we adopted the kids that we um, rescued in 2014, and the adoption took three and a half years. It was ridiculous, right? Was, wow. But we learned a lot about the adoption process. And there's some countries like Haiti, or you know, countries that are going through like war, like Ukraine, where like the only sure safety for them to not be hurt is to adopt them out into a loving family, you know? And, and so it's, it's a preventative action where we go into high trafficking areas like Haiti, 
we find families, one of the biggest deterrents is it's, it's like $30,000 or more to adopt international adoption. And like who, the families that are, that are in that parenting phase generally don't have that kind of disposable income. So we come in and with the grant and the guidance and connect them with the adoption agency and we get the kids adopted. And do you also kind of, because I've heard a lot of stories about the, the troubles with adopting out of country as well. And I, I have like a friend with a personal experience too about like the way that kind of women can even be exploited in that aspect of like giving birth and oh, then yeah. multiple times like adopting yes. out to, you know, Westerners and stuff as opposed, yeah, so oh, yeah, do you know much about oh, that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Trafficking can seep right into this the legitimate system mm-hmm. where you're, so yeah. So how do, you, how do you combat that? So, so, like the, the, so the international community has come up with something called the Hague Convention, where it's it, it's it, they put literally very strict regulations on like full investigations are done about with these kids before you can adopt them, like where they came from, do they have parents, is there some kind of a nasty business behind the scenes going on? Where we, I mean, we see cases like this in like we're in Africa. This is it's even worse than what you're saying than what you just told me. But they're they're like bringing these women in, like it hurts to even say this, but they're they're impregnating them. And then they're taking their babies, and this sounds crazy, but it's true because we're, we're we've just we've done we can't we can't publicize quite yet because we're in the middle of it, but I can say it's in Africa, and they're taking the babies and selling them for the for their organs. Oh my gosh! Right, so it's like that's like in a very very extreme. But others, you know, they're selling them just to be adopted because an American family mm-hmm. or a French family, whatever, wants a little baby. Yeah. And so it's like well, just it's just like this market, and the women can be getting, can be getting trafficked. Mm-hmm. Right and and just producing these babies on, against their will, um, so the Hague Convention does a lot to 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 help that. So we work within with countries that have adopted that, um, and then we our job like validating what are like the organization that is work that you can go ex- through exactly. Yeah. That's saying that this they're going to follow these this law these laws, and the U.S. State Department is a real big part in making sure they're compliant as well. Right. And we went through it, so we know. It's like we were investigated up and down, sideways, and every other way to make sure we weren't traffickers. Yeah. You know, which is great. I'm like, awesome. Ironic, yeah. but yes. Yes. Um, let's do it. So, but still, it takes so long. So, we're trying to help these countries to kind of digitize some of their systems so they can, like, the application process can move along and then find families, find kids, and then, you know, and then, uh, right. f- and then fill the, the budgetary financial needs. So, we've been able to help a lot in that way. And we had a lot of adoptions in the process in Ukraine before the war. So now we even have a more vested interest. In fact, it was Catherine was like, go to Ukraine, go, go. She's trying to get me like to go. <laughs> right. To, cause we need to get in there because it's not just about ex- extracting the kids. This is the first thing. Let's, let's get adoptions going again and doing it right. And let's help the police. And so yeah. now it's kind of a full court press with multiple agencies. Right. Uh, how, how often, you, you mentioned that in some cases it's necessary to have the kids adopted out. But do you ever work with... Um, agencies or with these situations to help kids be adopted within their own country so they can stay Absolutely. in their own country. Yeah, that's that's awesome. We can do that. So we've done that in like Uganda and other places where it's like, yeah, we, we would love that. Um, usually in the countries that are high trafficking risk countries, there's not an abundance of people that are in a position to to adopt. to adopt is the problem. But yes, that's our first choice. So yeah, how do you help fix that? I mean, you can't fix all the problems in the world, but like how do you make that so it is easier for kids sometimes in those situations to be able to stay in their country sometimes, right? Yeah, we, we look for families. We do, we look for families. Um, we work with adoption agencies within those countries and say, can you find families here? Mm-hmm. Because if they can stay here, that's probably better for them. Right. You know, and this create a, a, an environment here of... Of um, you know the the orphanage system is outdated. The U.S. got rid of it a long time ago. We don't have orphanages. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's foster. Foster's got all sorts of problems, but it's yeah. it's a step in the right direction. So we're trying to encourage some of these countries to go that route to do foster care, take the kids into families, to homes. You know, let them be with a loving environment, kind of thing, um, which is somewhere between that and it, between orphanage and adoption, right? But adoption is the ultimate like gift, I think, to a child. Wow. So. Um, one thing I remember that I wanted to ask you when you're talking about Ukraine, how do you know if like a child who is orphaned is truly orphaned in such a war zone situation? Like, is there a chance that maybe just their parents are missing? Totally, totally. And this is where the hate convention, thank goodness, exists. So like, I mean, uh, just 680 some odd kids already that our teams have pulled out, right? And that number is going to double, quadruple. Every one of those is going to have a question, like a question mark. Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. Exactly. 
uh, do you, are your parents alive? Mm-hmm. Are you an orphan? Or are you, you know... Do you know if your parents are alive? Right. And so th- if, if any of them were going to pursue an, an adoption route, then that's where the Hague Convention would come in and we'd start investigating all that. As it is, we'll investigate it. We'll do everything we can to figure out. And this is why we went to the police. Because before, two weeks ago, when, or last week, whenever I was there, um, we were just working with child protection. Like the, the group that runs all the orphanage systems to help get the kids out, right? Mm-hmm. And that expanded into non-orphans right who whose kids whose ki- kids just kind of ended up displaced and now it's turned into now we're talking to the law enforcement the anti-trafficking unit and helping them be proactive about investigating now who are these kids where where have they gone to um you know we we have heard all sorts of stories and there's lots of news media on this as well about like aid workers that show up hey come on i'll take you to holland get in my car get my van i'm a nice guy okay let's go and no, we're, I don't know. I, I assume they're happy. So, or maybe they're trafficked, right? Mm-hmm. We, have, we work in, the, in Latin America right now, and we have assets down there. And we're seeing, I mean, I was actually on an undercover operation a month ago, within a month or two ago, where um, when the war started, they were looking for Ukrainian girls. It was like harvest time. You know, it was like, hey, there's going to be a lot of girls. They're going to be vulnerable. A lot of them are really good looking. We would love to have them in our sex industry, you know, and we've already heard that chatter and movements to get these girls. Now's the time to traffic them into other countries, like in Latin America, where Eastern European is, is you know, something unusual that, that sickos will want to engage with, you know. So um, we are making efforts right now. We have, an, we have a European department at OUR that's already way before the war. We've been working with several countries mm-hmm. with, it, with providing these tools, technology, like we do in the United States. And we are now putting an emphasis with them on finding Ukrainian girls or kids who are likely being trafficked through Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and even into the Western Hemisphere. Wow. So we're, we're, doing, we're beginning a lot of preventative action right now with all that. So you need a lot of support yes. in order for you to be able to accomplish what you're, what you're looking to do and to really get down to the truth, the details, who's, who's exactly. who, what's what, if these kids are truly orphans or not, just everything. There's so many factors so that many. are involved. So yeah. You need like so much, so much human power. We do. We need, we need a double our man power. Yeah. And that's why this documentary, I want to turn around quick and say, guys, help us. Yeah. You know, someone suggested we were just going to do it for free. And someone said, Hey, why don't you charge people five bucks to watch it? Yeah. All the money goes. To the, the I money. think, I think people would love that. People will pay $5. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. How can people support? You talked about this earlier, just to finish this conversation. I'm sure a lot of people are looking like, okay, I want to be able to help in some way. Can people volunteer even, or yeah. can they apply to jobs even to yeah. do this as some kind of career path to help in the organization? Absolutely. Yeah. We're, what are the opportunities as well as donating? Yeah. So if you go to our website and, and join the fight, you can become a, um, we have something called the conductor club. The conductor is like what Harriet Tubman was. We, again, we love paying homage to the, they're our heroes, mm-hmm. the original Underground Railroad, right? Mm-hmm. And what they did and the bravery and the, and, and the conductors were the ones that got their hands dirty, right? They went in. And so we have this conductor club of like those who want to do more. Like it's like a volunteer, but, 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 um, um, but it's, uh, we, 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 we vet them out. You know, we, uh, they take a test and they become qualified to start doing more, more like get more active a lot of those people end up working for us like in a paid capacity and, and that's what we hope to do is continue to grow out. And we have these conductor clubs all over the United States. I think there's a couple dozen of them. Almost every big city has one. And then you join that club and now you go to those meetings and you start learning about what you can do locally and then we have reps from our headquarters come and talk to them. And So find your local chapter of Operation Underground Railroad. Become a conductor. Go to the conductor club uh, and... Uh, and and get involved, and then you'll then you'll kind of know what you can do. Like I'm a good writer, or like I can write, or I'm I'm good on social media, or I'm a I can do event planning, or I'm former military law enforcement. I can come in that way. You know, I'd love to get involved with helping you investigate and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a vetting process, like you said, in regards to a test. And everything yes, like that. very very much. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I think this was a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate everything that you shared. And I hope this inspires people to support our rescue in some format, in some way. Thank you so much. No, yeah. really, Ellen has been awesome. And I'm I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people listening, is this is their first exposure to what we're doing. And so I ask, I ask you all, just look, look deeper, 
search your heart and see if there's something you want to get involved in. We'd love to have you part of our team. Amazing. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you next episode.